Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's program at the Commonwealth Club. My name's Kishore Hari, and I'm pleased to be your moderator for tonight's program. Joining us this evening is the one and only Steven Pinker, Johnstone Family Professor of Psychology at Harvard University and author of the best-selling book, Enlightenment Now. Dr. Pinker, Dr. Pinker is an experimental cognitive psychologist. Progress that humanity has made through enlightenment thinking. While today's world can be characterized by hyperpolarization, disintegrating discourse, and the degradation of facts, he argues that the world is actually improving. So please join me now in welcoming Dr. Steven Pinker. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, Steve, I made the mistake of opening Twitter before I came out here, and now I don't feel like the world is in a good place. <laughs> um, which I think is a key feature of, the, of that app. Um, you spend a lot of time arguing the reverse, that this, is one of, this might be the greatest time to be alive. How so? Uh, people are living longer, and mm -hmm. what's more fundamental than life? Uh, people are uh, wealthier, uh, and by that I don't mean the 1%, but I mean uh, the bottom 10%, that uh, rates of extreme poverty have been plunging by about three quarters in just the last three decades. Uh, rates of literacy have, uh, have increased. About 90% of the world's population under the age of 25 can read and write. Rates of death in, uh, uh, from all forms of violence are in decline. There are fewer people are killed in war in uh, this dec decade than uh, in the 90s, the 80s, the 70s, the 60s, the 50s, to say nothing of the, uh, the, the uh, world wars. Rates of violent crime have been declining, including violence against women. Uh, so in most measures of human well-being, uh, you see improvements over a, a span of decades and centuries. If I you know, wasn't uh, mistaken, you sound like a hyper-optimist to me. Actually, is that the point of this book? No, the point actually is not optimism at all. The point is uh, knowing the facts. That it, it's not a question of, well, if, if global poverty has fallen to um, 10%, should we, concentrate, should we be happy about the 90% or uh, upset about the 10%? The fact is, we should know that the numbers are 90% and 10%. Most people don't know that. Most people, when asked, is poverty across the world, extreme poverty, increasing or decreasing, a majority say increasing or staying the same. The correct answer is that it's decreasing. Now, this isn't a question of optimism. This is a question of just knowing facts. Likewise, is the rate of death in warfare higher or lower now than it was, say, in the 1980s? Now, it's not a question of being optimistic that there are fewer wars or pessimistic that there is still an, uh, awful wars in Syria and Yemen and, uh, and elsewhere. It's a question of just knowing which way the world is, is going. What, what uh, the late Swedish doctor Hans Rosling calls factfulness. Factfulness, I like just that. Just knowing term. what the facts are. Now, uh, now, should we be? Uh, My wife is going to call me full of facts later. And I don't know <laughs> how I'm going to feel about it. <laughs> why? Uh, why a return to the Enlightenment of of all the periods of human history to yeah. to kind of crawl back towards? Why the Enlightenment? It's been 200 plus years since. Yeah, this no, it's, it's not a, it's not, it's not a return. It's not crawling back. It's not, you know, making, uh, bringing, bringing back the Enlightenment. It's a question of, um, of affirming, uh, a uh, set of ideals that were most uh, uh, articulately uh, um, stated uh, during the Enlightenment, but that are still relevant, namely reason, science, and humanism. Let's start to unpack those ideals. Um, but, but first, a minor history lesson. What made those ideas emerge at that time? So we, we, it's, it's a hard question to answer because it only happened once. And so with, as with any <laughs> historical event, we can't kind of replay the, the, the tape a number of times and, and count the number of ways of times it went in different directions depending on what immediately preceded it. But uh, plausibly, um, the... Uh, rise of uh, print and literacy, that if you were to look at something that happened before the, say, the second half of the 18th century, if that's when you want to more or less center the, the, uh, the, the Enlightenment, um, it was an era in which the population of European countries um, surpassed 50% literacy for the first time in history. 
It was a time at which uh, the cost of printing a book or a pamphlet plummeted. Uh, so there was greater mobility of people and ideas. Uh, it may have been the historical memory of the wars of religion uh, of the um, 16th century, uh, 16th and 17th century, that uh, people realized that um, um, killing people by the tens of millions, depending on their interpretation of the Holy Trinity, probably isn't the best way to run a society. Mm -hmm. uh, it, in part, it was the um, fruits of the scientific revolution, which showed that a lot of uh, age-old human beliefs were, were, were outright false, of which the, 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 the belief that the sun ro revolves around the earth is maybe the most famous example. Uh, mm -hmm. And perhaps the, the result of uh, the age of uh, exploration, that there were all of these continents that f teeming with life, with peoples, with of, uh, different cultures that people didn't even know existed until uh, a century before. Mm -hmm. So it expanded people's horizons. So all of these things, we don't really know what was the cause, but, um, but they, all, they all seem to come together. I, and I want to unpack some of these ideas now. So when you say reason, I think that means something different nowadays than what you, un you uh, unpack in the book. What, what do you mean by reason? Um, the, rationality, logic, uh, evidence okay, it does that mean is the having same good. Thing. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rationality, uh, logic, as opposed to. As opposed to dogma, as opposed to parsing scriptures, as opposed to authority, as opposed to conventional wisdom. Uh, as opposed to gut feelings, the, the feeling of subjective uh, certainty and uh, the, the glow of, of uh, feeling that you're in the right because you're you and, and you're, you're omniscient and infallible, mm -hmm. uh, or that someone else who you admire says that they're omniscient or infallible. Uh, superstition, uh, dogma. Mm -hmm. Fair. Uh, so those are all alternatives to reason. And science? So, science, uh, I, I think of science as the application of reason to the, the natural world. So not all of reason is science, because there's also logic, there's also mathematics, there's also moral arguments. But when you apply reason to uh, the, way, the, the way things uh, work, then mm -hmm. we call it science. And then the, the one that I, I think most people haven't, haven't heard of, or at least unpacked, which is humanism. Yeah. Uh, so humanism is just the idea that the ultimate moral good is to promote human well-being. That is the, the health, the happiness, the longevity, the knowledge, the experience of uh, men, women, and children, uh, and other animals, but we'll, we'll, we'll begin with humans. Uh, as opposed to, now you can say, well, who could be opposed to that? I mean, who could be against people living longer and, and uh, uh, being healthier and, and uh, having enough to eat. Well, there are alternative moral systems, such as that the ultimate good is to carry out God's commandments uh, or to maximize the glory of the nation or the race uh, or the creed. Uh, so even though it may seem to be completely unexceptionable that you do what makes the most people better off, uh, it actually, in a way, it's kind of a radical idea. I was actually surprised to see um, morality have such a place in this book in, in that way, because I ascribe to reason and science, not, I don't ascribe that word moral much. Why do you think that it's such an important component here? Well, the, uh, we all are um, <clears throat> uh, guided by uh, our own sense of morality. Uh, a lot of our uh, arguments um, uh, involving what we should do, in fact, any time we even use the word, a word like should or ought, uh, we are making a, a moral judgment. So we all need some kind of moral system that we rely on either explicitly or implicitly. And the question is, what are they? How can we articulate it? How do we give some, um, some muscle behind the uh, intuition that something is good or bad or that we should do it or should not do it? And you suggest that reason, when combined with science, when combined with humanism, flow into this idea of progress. Yes, at least in, 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 uh, in theory, and this was the great hope of the Enlightenment of the 18th century, that if we apply reason and science to the goal of improving human well-being, then uh, we can gradually succeed. The future can be better than the 
present, which can be better than the past. Now, of course, there's no guarantee that it would work. Maybe it's uh, you know, maybe it was a pipe dream. Maybe the the the, the gods are uh, sadistic and they will foil the best laid plans of uh, of mice and humans. Uh, so it's an empirical question whether progress has taken place. And of course, a big uh, uh, argument of the book is that whereas the question of progress may have been hypothetical 250 years ago, now we can answer it, and the, the data are in, and there has there there has been progress. Is it? inevitable for progress to flow from those things. It, can progress be generated from other systems operating together? Well, it's, it's not inevitable, because um, it may be that we cannot attain the knowledge that's necessary to improve human well-being, that it's just uh, recalcitrant, that, that, that um, germs and pathogens uh, emerge faster than we can develop vaccines to combat them, or that uh, the human population multiplies faster than we can figure out ways to, to feed it, or human nature means that we'll always be at each, at each other's throats and that uh, peace is a, uh, uh, a fantasy. So all of those could be true, and that, that's why I argue it's essential to go to the data and see whether, in fact, uh, there have been um, increases in longevity and, and uh, victories against disease. But but to push this forward, could, could we have dogmatic systems? Could we have uh, ones that are derived from authority that result in progress as well? Well, I think that, that can happen uh, occasionally by, by chance or happenstance. But it would be uh, uh, amazingly improbable that uh, a insistence that the world works in a particular way without actually looking at the world to see if it does work that way. Uh, it'd be amazing if that would, were to work. Simply because we are humans, we're not, we're not gods, uh, we haven't been granted the gift of, of uh, omniscience or infallibility. If someone claims that they have it, it's probably a good policy to take it with, with a lot of skepticism. <laughs> I, I think that's fair in today's uh, world. The Enlightenment um, is especially Western uh, happen, happening. It, so, like it happened in Europe uh, in, in a lot of the ways that history has ascribed it. But I think you say, no, the Enlightenment was something that occurred worldwide. Well, the, the, um, you know, everything had to happen somewhere first. Um, and so there is, uh, you sometimes see the expression, the European Enlightenment. And um, uh, what I have in mind in what I had in mind in, in entitling the book Enlightenment now was not to say, well, uh, a bunch of guys and a, a couple of women uh, figured it all out in the second half of the 18th century. Let's go back and see what they said and do what they said we should do. Mm -hmm. That's definitely not the uh, the idea. The idea is that the ideals of reason, science, and, and humanism are ones that we should uh, embrace. I needed a, a name for that. I could have called it. Uh, Cosmopolitan liberalism, or secular humanism, or the open society. It doesn't society. have the same ring to it. But it yeah, yeah, it seems that. Uh, but it, and and it's true that a lot of Enlightenment thinkers came from uh, Scotland and France and uh, the the, uh, uh, the the American colonies. But the um, but it had to, they had to come from somewhere, and they have uh, the Enlightenment ideals of skepticism and reason have popped up through history in, in many civilizations. You can see them in classical Arab civilization, in uh, the Mughal civilization of, uh, of India in the 17th century. Well, let's and, even talk about it in a modern and, context. I, I think a lot of us would look at what's happening in China right now and say, there's a great deal of progress happening there. Yet that is still an authoritarian system uh, of rule. And you might, you might say some of these components don't operate in the way uh, that you present in the book. Well, that is true, and that there it, it, it is a, um, a a bundle that of uh, ideals that aren't always uh, found together. China has embraced um, markets as a generator of of prosperity and wealth. That was a major Enlightenment idea. They certainly have embraced science, another uh, Enlightenment ideal. Uh, the, the ideal of progress, of not trying to wrench society back to a golden age or having a fatalistic attitude that uh, uh, there's nothing new under the sun, there's no, we can't do anything better than what we have now. Uh, on the other hand, what they don't clearly have is democracy and, and human rights. Mm -hmm. And the question is, will that 
package of markets and science and uh, without uh, human, human, humanism and human rights, um, how, how sustainable is that? And by the way, even in comparison to, say, to the years of Mao, um, there are a lot, a lot more respect for human freedom in China now than there was in the, uh, from the 50s through the uh, 70s. You mentioned democracy, markets. Uh, you ascribe the Enlightenment as, as helping produce those ideals. Yeah. Um, talk to us about how the Enlightenment made markets, democracy, a number of other things we ascribe to modern society. Yeah, the, um, uh, the, the role of markets was we usually associated with Adam Smith and David Ricardo and, and some of, the, and some of their, their predecessors. And it was a, um, a, a radical break from the dominant theory of, of economics at the time, which is that you organize a society with royal charters and monopolies and elites get uh, kind of control over some sector of the market that they that kind of belongs to them and that they seek collect rents out of, uh, as opposed to anyone being able to make uh, or offer anything they want to anyone and, and um, people buy uh, what they can afford, mm -hmm. uh, d depending on who offers them the best deal. Uh, and Smith articulated why <clears throat> markets can generate uh, prosperity. And I should mention, perhaps the most radical idea is that um, wealth has to be created in the first place, that the natural state of humanity is poverty. Poverty needs no explanation. Uh, that's just the world we, are, we, are, we evolved into. And what needs explanation is wealth. Why is there any wealth at all? And uh, Adam Smith and others explained it in terms of a combination of specialization and exchange. If you get better and better at doing one thing, you make it with fewer materials, with less energy, more efficiently, someone else makes something else uh, also more efficiently, and you get to exchange the fruits of your labor and ingenuity, then everyone can get uh, richer. I have to admit, That's when I opened the book, I was not expecting economics to come to bear from a cognitive psychologist, but I guess that's the, that's the modern world. Um, and, uh, I want to revisit some of the good news. Can you, I, can yeah, I just mention, add one more, um, just to, to, to um, complete the answer to your mm -hmm. question about whether the Enlightenment is a product of the West. Uh, it's not a product of the West in the sense that these are ideas that I, that I think are timeless, that reason just uh, applies to everyone always in making an argument for anything. It's not a, a Western, a particularly Western conceit. But also, the West itself hasn't really been that committed to Enlightenment ideals. Uh, really? How so? Well, no sooner than the... Uh, uh, I mean, well, you can go to your Twitter feed. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but not, not just in the sense that a lot of people are irrational, because that's the way people are, but in the fact that even as a philosophy, as a creed, as a set of ideals, no sooner did the Enlightenment emerge than, that, than there was a, a counter-enlightenment, a romantic movement, a valorization of blood and soil and race and, 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 and nation. And uh, the, the West has uh, had a tension between Enlightenment and counter-Enlightenment ideals uh, for, for 250 years. Uh, and in fact, it was really only, I would say it's really only after the Second World War that you really had Enlightenment ideals in the form of international organizations, a spread of democracy, globalization really become uh, ascendant. Before that, um, nationalism was a major uh, uh, belief system of of, uh, of states, uh, and and even today we're seeing with the rise of authoritarian populism, with the rise of Trumpism in the United States, these are um, florid counter enlightenment movements, uh, championed by uh, it, to the extent that I mean, it almost as I say in the book, it, it sounds like an oxymoron to talk about the intellectual roots of Trumpism, but they. Uh, <laughs> But they really, uh, and for a while I thought that Trump was just an eruption of, of raw instinct, of, of tribalism, of authoritarianism. But there are intellectuals uh, who defend Trump, and they often allude to counter-enlightenment ideas. Uh, Steve Bannon considers himself an intellectual. Uh, there were... Uh, 200 academics who signed a statement in support of Trump uh, a couple of months prior to the 2016 election. 
And the ideas behind Trumpism are counter-enlightenment ideas. There's no such thing as, um, uh, as humanity. There are just tribes. Uh, there are zero-sum competition between tribes. To uh, surrender national interests to global cooperation is to be a chump in a battle of uh, uh, tribe against tribe, race against race. So these are ideas. I think they're, they're terrible ideas, but they are ideas, and the West by no means uh, ever eschewed the, these ideas. This is a debate that's gone on within the West. So did you write this book in response to that rise of, of Trumpism, as you put it, this tribalism that was emerging? No, uh, although not at the outset, although I did have to incorporate that. Uh, the, uh, I began the book in uh, 2015. I signed the contract for the book in 2013. And so the idea that Donald Trump would be president was uh, like, came out of The Simpsons, I mean, quite literally. I mean, it was, it was that absurd at the time. The Simpsons has proven to be quite prescient. Well, indeed, <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so it did require, and this was uh, a, pretty, uh, a pretty conspicuous elephant in the room that I could not ignore in a book on progress. And so I did deal with the, uh, it forced me to confront the fact that the, that the West, right up to the present, has not been synonymous with enlightenment So uh, what project. trends were you seeing around that 2013, 2015 time oh, yeah. that did inspire you though? So it, in, in, in a sense, Enlightenment Now was a, um, something of a sequel to The Better Angels of Our Nature, the book that I published in 2011, which was inspired by my coming across <clears throat> many data sets showing that rates of violence had been in historical decline. Mm -hmm. uh, a realization that you can't come to from reading the news because news covers violence wherever it occurs. It does not cover, tend to cover nonviolence. Mm -hmm. You don't see a reporter saying, I'm reporting uh, live from a school that's not been shot up or a country that's at peace. You don't see a headline saying, uh, Southeast Asia hasn't had a war for 30 years. Uh, but it's San when Francisco you, streets clean. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. These are things you don't see on the news. Yes. But when you when you plot rates of violence over time, uh, that's when you see a decline because a rate of violence, number of people killed per hundred thousand per year, includes both the people who are killed in the numerator and the people who aren't killed that go into the denominator, and that's when you can appreciate something that otherwise could elude uh, detection. So the, the Better Angels of Our Nature was on uh, six historical declines of violence. And when I completed the book, then I realized that there were actually, once you take that, that, that mindset of assessing the world by quantitative measures over time, not over reports of things that go wrong, because things will always go wrong. They'll, they'll never be, the world will never be perfect. It would be dangerous to try to make it perfect. Uh, but, and you just simply can't have any idea as to whether things are improving or not unless you look at data. Well, if you look at data, if you expand the data you look at from violence to other measures of human well-being, such as nutrition, such as infectious disease, such as leisure time, such as uh, democracy, such as longevity, such as literacy, all of those are going in a positive direction too, and no one seemed to know about it. Uh, so you're a cognitive psychologist. Why don't I feel those trends then? Because when I yeah. think about this, I, I can look at the data and say, oh yeah, human lifespan is increasing and has been for a long period of time now. You know, we've flattened out in the last couple of years here in the US, but by and large, it's been going up. I don't feel that way. I feel the, the oncoming approach of, of obesity and of uh, the rise in type two diabetes, et cetera. Uh, am I not just predisposed to good news? Yeah, there, well, there is. Um, there's, I think there's some systematic reasons why we're, our, our understanding of the world is disconnected from, from uh, reality. Uh, one of them is a, a feature of, of uh, human psychology called the availability heuristic. That's a term from uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman, that we often assess uh, probability, risk, danger by how easily examples come to mind. Uh, how, uh, how vivid an image is, how striking a narrative, uh, and that um, <clears throat> uh, since what the news is, does is report 
things that happen, not things that don't happen, and that things that happen are more likely to be negative than positive. Um, it's, uh, you, you don't have a headline that 137,000 people escaped from extreme poverty yesterday, although the papers could have run that headline every day for the last 30 years, as, as Max Roser has, has pointed out. Uh, if you combine the nature of news, which is to report things that go wrong, with the nature of cognition, which is to be um, uh, affected by vivid images and narratives and stories, we're as news gathering becomes more efficient, we're guaranteed to almost to think that things are getting worse, even if as they're getting better. So that's one reason. And putting on my scientist hat, are, are we evolved in, in our evolutionary history? Is that a, a situation that we were naturally predisposed to? Because our brains aren't moving at the, spe at the speed of, of news, if you will, in terms yes. of it, it, its development. Yeah, I think that that's right, that the uh, data sets really didn't exist until quite recently. We're, we're naturally enumerate. The uh, arithmetic mathematics are recent inventions in human history, uh, have existed for a fraction of the time we've been, when, been uh, human. Um, so we're not, and, and there is, it's not uh, a, um, a, a catastrophic defect that our mind goes with uh, examples and anecdotes, because after all, those are uh, not only available before the existence of literacy and data gathering organizations, but they do reflect local conditions uh, as a not a bad first approximation. It, it really is true that um, uh, there are more pigeons in the city than, than, than white-breasted nuthatches. Uh, and you know that without having to do a bird census. You don't have to look at data. You just consult your, your images. And that's the case where your images are, are, are correct. And they often are correct. But not when it comes to a world of 7 billion people. Yeah, uh, so this is one of the things that struck me is if that doesn't come naturally to us, this idea of, of thinking in the world in these hyper-rational ways through the lens of data because... We are human. We are predisposed to our evolutionary roots. Aren't you asking us to take a little bit of a leap of faith well, uh, it, to, to think this way? No, it's not a leap of faith. It's a leap. It's a leap of education. It's the opposite of a leap of faith. Uh, that is, we... It, it certainly does require uh, inhibiting certain impulses and, and instincts, not going with our, our, our gut feelings. To, uh, to allow our uh, best data, our best reason, our, the fruits of our educational system to override our intuitions. I, I just think back to, um, I can't remember exactly when, but George W. Bush talking about leading from his gut and um, how attractive that was to see a leader talk about it in that way. Um, you ascribe like the leaders that we should really be attracted to are the ones that speak to reason and science because they're going to be grounded in progress. Um, is, is that a, a fair assessment of, of, of your point? Yes, well, the, the, that uh, the policy should be based on rational analysis, for sure. Uh, now, of course, a politician in a democracy, in order to be elected, has to appeal to people with all of their biases and emotions and intuitions. And so a skilled politician uh, and an admirable politician would be one who combines the most rational analysis of policy with the greatest skill in uh, attracting the uh, attention and, and support of, uh, of the people of the country. So when they don't, we call the, the person a demagogue. Uh, when they do, then that, that's probably the, the best that we can hope for in leadership in a democracy. Uh, the best we can hope for. I feel like that is resonant right now. Um, <laughs> why go back 200 years? That timeline seems arbitrary at some point. I understand you were going back to the Enlightenment, but why not 50 years ago or or more realistically for us, the, even the last 10 to 20? Because I tend not to, to view my life in the context of, wow, in 1715, they weren't doing as well uh, as I am now. I tend to think about like how I was doing a year ago, maybe even 10 years ago. 
Well, the thing is that these, these trends are uh, visible not just over centuries, but over decades and, and over years. I mean, not all of them. There's always wiggles. There can be reversals. There can be sickening lurches. But uh, going back to, say, extreme poverty, mm -hmm. uh, as I mentioned, that's 137,000 people a day for the last 30 years. Uh, who've escaped extreme poverty. Um, when it comes to uh, uh, war and democracy, just in my own lifetime, I mean, I, I, when I was a college student, the world had 31 democracies. Today it has 103. Uh, there were wars that killed people at a rate of uh, um, 9 per 100,000 per year. Now the rate is about 1.4 per 100,000 per year. So these aren't centuries. I mean, I'm, I'm not that old, but this is in, in my own... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this wasn't uh, a biography. This is no. not a biography, <laughs> no. So, uh, again, not everything. It's, it, it would be, uh, it'd be inconceivable that everything that you measure over history goes down uh, uh, monotonically. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not reasonable to expect that. But still, even when there are reversals and wiggles, you do see uh, overall um, a, a lot of these trends. Not all of them, but a lot of them do extend over the, the range of decades and years. Uh, okay, I can get behind progress being a good thing. Uh, and generally, uh, that us as humanity as a whole has been progressing over a long period of time. And we don't recognize that. But at the same time, I recognize for many sets of people or individuals, it doesn't feel that way. And w there's lots of data to back this up, too. Like, we can look at uh, wages for African American men who have been consistently at roughly 65% that of, of a white uh, equivalent. Uh, so there's inequality here as well. So does this work equally? Does this progress, is it shared equally amongst all of us? Well, th that would be impossible. That, mm -hmm. for, that, that for, every, for all 7.3 billion people, everyone's fortunes rise exactly in lockstep. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would, be, that, just, that would be magic. That just mm -hmm. can't happen. But, uh, uh, but the, the fortunes of African-American men have absolutely improved. Now, even if it's, uh, the, the uh, gap hasn't narrowed, and the gap has narrowed in many dimensions, such as education, such as happiness, such as longevity. Um, but the fact that the gap hasn't narrowed doesn't mean that the, that, uh, the, the fortunes of African-American men are the same. They have improved, uh, even if the rates of uh, improvement of European-American men may have improved uh, uh, as well. So the, the, the relative standing of different racial groups, although, of course, ideally we want it to be reduced and eventually eliminated, but that doesn't mean that there hasn't been any improvement. And in fact, there has been a much greater rate of improvement in the happiness of African Americans than of white Americans. Uh, expanding beyond America, has the Enlightenment, have these ideals benefited everyone worldwide? Or we still see pockets of this globe that it's yet to really um, seen the benefit of. Oh yes, no. The, uh, so just think of the if if you note the fact that uh, extreme poverty uh, has fallen to ten percent. That's that's seven hundred million people or or, or more. Um, and uh, again, it would be a, a a miracle if every last person in every last corner of the world suddenly got as rich as a typical Swede. Uh, it just, history can't work that way. Ideas, innovations proliferate from uh, different, uh, countries have different um, systems of governance. There are all kinds of ways in which the world is a, not a homogeneous place. But have, uh, ha has this progress applied to the worst off? The, uh, the answer is absolutely yes. And again, the, the figure that we've mentioned a number of times, namely that the proportion of the world's population that falls below the cutoff for extreme poverty has been plunging is the most dramatic example. But also the fact that longevity has increased in every country. Uh, child mortality has decreased in every country. Morta maternal mortality has decreased in every country. Um, lifespan has increased. Um, uh, I mentioned literacy. So these are global developments. They are not... Uh, there was a... Um, after the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment, uh, I mean, one way of thinking about human history is that a few hundred years ago, almost everyone was wretched. Everyone died young, uh, except for a tiny, tiny elite. Uh, everyone was hungry, everyone was illiterate, everyone was uh, vulnerable to disease, everyone saw a, a third or more of their babies die. 
Uh, then with the Industrial Revolution and the Enlightenment, some parts of the world began to pull away from the rest. And, uh, but more recently, in the last um, uh, 60 or 70 years, that gap has been closing, and the developing world is uh, starting to narrow the gap with uh, Europe and the Americas. And so I have many graphs in the book that, that show that. Hans Rosling, in his animations, shows it even more dramatically, where you can see in, in one of his, his most famous animations <coughs> showing um, uh, a, a square in which the lower left corner corresponds to being poor and uh, dying young, and the upper right corner corresponds to being rich and living long. And uh, time in the animation is history. The clock starts uh, in 1800, and basically all of the world's countries are kind of floating in the lower left-hand corner. And you see a few European and American countries kind of start to float up the diagonal. Uh, and then when the, when the clock gets to the last few decades, you see more and more uh, countries um, climbing the diagonal and the former gap between the West and the rest uh, eliminated. Uh, there are other products of the Enlightenment beyond uh, democracy and markets and, and things generally seen as positive impacts. We can talk about nuclear weapons. Uh, we can talk about... Um, uh, just weapons of war, things that have led to devastation. The Enlightenment hasn't just produced uh, positive impacts. How does that fit into this, uh, in, into this idea that you're, you're presenting today? Yeah, well, some things are, uh, by the way, nuclear weapons have not led to devastation. They could lead to devastation. That's the problem. But in fact, they have. I'm, I'm jumping to, ahead. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but compared to... Uh, Compared to uh, uh, you know, old-fashioned artillery, to say nothing of uh, spears and swords, they actually, nuclear weapons actually haven't killed a lot of people. But uh, nonetheless, they are humanity's greatest threat. They were, uh, I think, a colossal blunder. Uh, mm -hmm. They didn't uh, have to have been invented. I think it was, there was a, a set of historical circumstances that led to humanity, one of humanity's greatest blunders. Uh, and I have a, a lengthy discussion of nuclear weapons in, in the book in which I um, uh, advocate a, um, uh, a program that was, seemed to be on the rise just uh, four or five years ago, and it's since gone into uh, um, somewhat of a abeyance of moving to global zero, that is, of eliminating all nuclear weapons uh, everywhere. Uh, I, an idea that was, even though it sounds like a kind of, you know, kind of peacening, peacenik, uh, left-wing um, uh, utopian fantasy, it was actually embraced by some of the most notorious Cold War hawks, originally by Ronald Reagan, uh, famously. Of course, we all made fun of him for uh, proposing that that he and Gorbachev eliminate all nuclear weapons at the time. Uh, more recently by Henry Kissinger and Sam Nunn and George Shultz and William Perry. And there's a, there's a global zero movement that uh, we, uh, the Barack Obama uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize in part for, for uh, uh, endorsing it, as did his uh, Russian counterpart, uh, Dmitry Medvedev. Now, with the transition from Medvedev and Obama to Putin and Trump, we don't hear so much about global zero. Uh, but, uh, but I advocate, and, and one can hope, that its time will, will come again and, and uh, in, in not too many years. Uh, so the, nuclear weapons certainly is a, a, a blunder made possible by the, the growth of science. And, uh, and another, of course, um, uh, massive I, problem. So you're not arguing that this this I, uh, applying the Enlightenment ideals is a perfect solution? Well, it's just a better solution? Compared to what? Compared to whatever it is we call what is happening now. <laughs> uh, with the, uh, well, no, I think that the, uh, uh, no, I, I would say that applying reason and, and uh, humanism to human betterment would call for eliminating nuclear weapons. That is, if you care about, if, if you think that it would be bad for tens or hundreds of millions of people to die a horrible death, then we should take steps to make that less likely. And that would involve strengthening international regimes of denuclearization. Well, uh, so let's prognosticate forward a little bit. We have more than nuclear weapons facing us as a threat as a society as a whole. I would say climate change feels like an existential threat for all of us. Um, 
the massive loss of biodiversity that is happening across uh, the world. How would Enlightenment ideals tackle some of these imminent threats? Well, to see them as, as um, problems to be solved and figure out the, uh, the best way to get to a solution. So in the case of climate change, uh, it would be to um, impose policies such as carbon pricing that would uh, allow the cost of uh, damage to the planet from carbon emissions to be factored into uh, hundreds of millions of economic decisions. Every time you flip a light switch, every time you uh, go from A to B, you factor in the, uh, the harm done by your decision to the environment. Um, and by uh, uh, advances in technology that allow people to uh, enjoy the things that they want, such as being warm in winter and cool in summer and being able to get from A, a to B and light their homes with the least damage to the, uh, the atmosphere. And so that involves continual um, advances in technology to, to uh, uh, decarbonize the economy as rapidly as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the questions that are emerging are about a future even beyond that. One where it's not just humans anymore, that there's artificial intelligence joining us uh, in play. What's sort of the, what's your thinking about a world where it's not just humans alone and we can't factor in just human-based thinking into our future? Well, we already live in a world in which it's not humans alone because there are other sentient creatures, animal, non-human animals. So, um, and, and of course, even though I endorse humanism, I note, as would most humanists, that that's just a, a, a label that ultimately it applies to any sentient creature, and that we so have if to. So, a super intelligent AI came across, it wouldn't be no different. No, no, I'm I'm I'm, I'm talking about you know rabbits and mice and <laughs> and, and, and birds, uh, and and cattle. But in terms of uh, human-made, there we don't really know. Uh, uh, and it'll be a long time t before we have to worry about the question of whether they're sentient in the sense of whether there's anyone home kind of feeling or suffering in a, in a robot when there's a, a warning switch that, that, that goes off. Um, so I don't worry about that, uh, that per se as an ethical issue, uh, that is the, the, the rights of robots. Um, there are other issues such as, will it cause massive unemployment? Will there be uh, decision-making that's, that's uh, offloaded from responsible humans and put in control of systems that we don't fully understand? I mean, those are ethical issues, but uh, I don't see, uh, especially since uh, artificially intelligent systems are not products of evolution. They don't inherently have a drive towards self-preservation, only to the extent that we wire them in, which, uh, which we'd have very little reason to do. Then the kind of um, self-perpetuating, um, self-protective uh, entity that we call an organism, uh, I don't think is going to be duplicated in, uh, in silicon. Have we reached the, the kind of pinnacle of what an enlightened society could look like? I sure hope not. <laughs> no. Um, what, what's, a, what's, what's missing? Where else can we go beyond continually growing a lot of the, these, these metrics by what we're measuring yeah. it? Like, what, paint so us a be, vision. Okay, so that would, that would be a, a start. So for, if we just got uh, Francis Fukuyama had the expression, getting to Denmark. Um, that is, Denmark, I mean, not that he was a Danish chauvinist, but as Denmark is a country that uh, in many years is the world's happiest by, in terms of how people rate their, their lives. It's got low rates of crime. It's got high rates of uh, gender equality. It's uh, affluent. It's healthy. Uh, people want to move there. Uh, if we got... Uh, every country to enjoy the benefits that Denmark now enjoys, that would be a better world. It doesn't mean they have to have Danish culture, but it would mean that they would have uh, <laughs> Dan Danish levels of well-being. Is Denmark the best we could do? Well, probably not. Uh, people could live longer. They could, I don't think we'll ever have a, uh, in fact, I know we won't have a, a utopia or a perfect world because we're we're human beings. We have uh, what's good for one person is not going to be good for uh, another person. We're not clones, so that if you, uh, there's uh, equality of outcome is going to be impossible unless you treat people unequally, because people are uh, uh, different, just because we're, we're, not, uh, we're not clones. Uh, what's best for 
Uh, men isn't that going to be best for women and vice versa. There are going to be compromises. Um, there are going to be uh, cultures aren't indistinguishable. That's why we value diversity and what's optimal for one country cu culture is not going to be optimal for another. So life is always going to be a matter of trade-offs. To say nothing of the fact that there are many features of the universe that are going to push back against uh, perfection, such as evolution in the form of pathogens and parasites that are always evolving to defeat our defenses, uh, entropy, the second law of thermodynamics, that uh, uh, there are more ways for things to go wrong than to, for things to go right. So there's uh, always going to be many uh, ways for things to fail. But we can reduce them. Uh, and we don't know how much better than Denmark we can get, but I'm sure it's better than, than, uh, than Denmark now. I know you said this wasn't written as an optimistic book. It was written more as a, a realistic book. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about pessimism. Yeah. Um, and it, it's that uh, I, I've long had this sense that uh, intellectuals thought pessimism was the more serious point of view. Yeah. And you're offering something, you're saying, you're offering a rebuke against that idea. Yeah. Um, talk about that a little bit, your, your thoughts are on pessimism, uh, and I'll expand upon that in a second. Yeah, there is a, um, a, a tendency to give more um, gravitas and credence to, to pessimists. Uh, there, a, a financial writer, Morgan Housel, once said that uh, pessimists sound like they're trying to help you. Optimists sound like they're trying to sell you something. Uh, uh, this may be a reflection of another uh, psychological feature, the, something called the negativity bi bias, that bad ways... Uh, uh, more heavily than good. We, are, we dread losses more than we look forward to gains. Uh, criticism stings more than praise uh, emboldens. Uh, we uh, remember recent bad events better than recent good events. And so that may kind of open up a, a niche for people to remind us of bad things that we may have overlooked. And so we do uh, ascribe greater moral seriousness to, to pessimists. Uh, the, the biblical prophets are, are a good example. We consider them both moral and they warned of imminent doom. Uh, whereas, um, and so I am pushing back against the natural tendency for, um, since it, it's kind of, uh, it, it's easy, it, it's kind of cheap and easy to be a pessimist because there'll always be things that go wrong. And you can, and if you assemble a list of all the worst things that are happening anywhere on the planet at any given time, it's always going to look pretty depressing. Now, of course, some things, times things do get worse. It's mm -hmm. not, this is not an argument for optimism in the sense that we should always believe things get better. Things don't always get better, and there, there's no reason to believe that they will left to their own devices. It's uh, rather that we should have the most accurate assessment that we can have of the state of the world and the direction that it's going, try to identify what it is that makes things better and do more of them. Now, you mentioned pessimism is cheap and easy. So naturally, I think we have to talk about the media. Um, so I, I'm being nostalgic, but I, in my house, I grew up and we would watch the news every night. And it wasn't good news back then. We'd watch Peter Jennings on ABC and there was always bad news. They'd left one segment at the end that was sort of the good news. But it does feel like there is a prevailing sense when I turn on the news now that it feels more pessimistic than ever. Yeah. Why are we seeing a trend line in that direction yeah. with the coverage of the narratives that we see out there? No, it, it's a good question. And, it, and it, um, uh, you know, I had to be careful not to say, fall into my own trap and say, well, the, 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 uh, the news is getting worse, uh, the, the news is getting more pessimistic without any data. And so I did find data. There is a, uh, a data scientist named uh, Khalif Litaro who did a, uh, ran an algorithm that tallied up the number of positive and negative words in news stories in the New York Times and in a sample of uh, global news services since the 1940s and found that, in fact, it, it has gotten more, more pessimistic. So just as people are living longer and, there's, and, and uh, rates of death and war have been going down and rates of illiteracy have been going down, the news has been getting more and more morose. And so this is a fact. This isn't just a uh, nostalgia. Who's leading the horse there? Is that reflective of something that we writ large as the public 
is inspiring the media to reflect yeah, good, that, or is it the reverse? It's a good question. If it was just the negativity bias in human nature, that would not predict that there should be a trend toward greater pessimism, because human nature uh, hasn't changed in the last 70 years. Uh, it may be a combination of our um, greater ability to gather news that we can send. Uh, well, we don't have to send news crews, new, news teams to the remote corners of the world. Now, everyone with a smartphone is a, uh, can, can beam video footage to the, to the web instantaneously. It's partly, paradoxically, the um, uh, kind of a gift of our expanding circle of empathy that we care more about people and not just people, other organisms and parts of the world that may have fallen be beneath our radar in the past. So we care more about famines in Africa and, uh, and wars in, in, in uh, Yemen than our ancestors may have and little kids being bullied and, um, and women being sexually harassed, which used to happen but just wasn't an issue. Now it is an issue. Um, and, and the third uh, and possible answer to your question is that there is a change, I think, in the culture of journalism where it's considered increasingly, uh, especially since the 70s, I think, that the uh, mores of, of, of responsible journalism are, are, were, uh, have increasingly been to point out what's going wrong, to speak truth to power, to, to rake the muck. Uh, and that there was a there's a revulsion, I think, in the culture of journalism to the old style of uh, being complicit with um, power structures, not to show Roosevelt from the waist down because it would he wouldn't look as presidential, to overlook JFK's affairs, to kind of be cheerleaders for the government. Now it's the other way around, perhaps even gone to an extreme where uh, every uh, civic institution is considered to be a target for an aggressive takedown. And there's a, a kind of cynicism that nothing can ever work, everything is corrupt, which may have had pernicious consequences. Uh, there has been some criticism of your book. You're not, that isn't new to you. Um, and one of the, the criticisms came from, from the right, especially the religious right, who saw this as a rebuke of the role of faith in society. Uh, and I'm curious what your thoughts were to that. Yeah, uh, yeah, I don't think that faith has a role in society. I mean, there's not just <laughs> faith in the sense of believing something without a reason. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't mean that there is no role for religious institutions in society. Mm -hmm. And religious institutions uh, have evolved. Uh, many of them have become more humanistic, even if they don't necessarily use that word. But, um, but yeah, I don't think that, that any collective decision should be based on, um, uh, on faith in the sense of believing something without a good reason, on the basis of tradition or dogma or authority. So what could be the role of religious institutions going forward then? Like, wh what opportunities do you see for them in, in a world that is, is driven by Enlightenment ideals? The um, well, religions have a, um, a, a rich historical legacy. They, they are, have been synonymous with our culture and civilization and pretty much until the Enlightenment. Um, it was probably only with the Enlightenment that you, there was even a distinction between religious and non-religious uh, um, institutions. They can be um, uh, uh, foci for um, communal uh, experience for people getting together and enjoying the warmth of a community, the uh, reassurance of tradition, the beauty of uh, liturgy and music and iconography. Uh, they can be movements for, uh, they can be civic, c civil society movements to uh, charities, um, mm -hmm. support for um, at risk youth. Um, providers of, of uh, health and mental health services. In parts of the world with very weak civil society organizations, they can be involved in, um, in uh, uh, peacemaking and peacekeeping, in uh, um, justice and rule of law. Um, so really there's, uh, as legacy institutions that command a great deal of loyalty, there is a potential for religions to be positive forces. What they, what, what I would, call it, and not, not just me, but, but many is just not to base <coughs> uh, any of the morality on uh, dogma, authority, scripture, but just to, to justify it, that 
health is good and peace is good and living together is good and tolerance is good and uh, education is good. And to the extent that these institutions dedicate themselves to those humanistic values, then they can be massive forces for good. You've also faced withering criticism from um, opponents on the left. Uh, you are a professor on a campus. You still teach courses. And you've been highly critical of politically correct environments on campus. And, and you've even posited that's given rise to some, uh, some elements in our society that are completely undesirable. Can you talk about that? Yeah, um, I think the, uh, t to my horror, I have had um, uh, uh, former students who have gravitated to the alt-right. Um, so these are not ignoramuses, these are not skinheads. Um, these are, uh, in, in some cases, extremely intelligent, articulate uh, people, but they have often been repelled by the uh, atmosphere of, um, of, of um, politically correct dogma on American campuses. Uh, and, and in, in certain American media. And often when they come across um, uh, politically incorrect um, uh, facts, they feel that the uh, entire establishment has been systematically repressing um, a, 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 a set of facts and feel emboldened that the exact opposite of the establishment must have a, a, a greater, be much more in tune to the, to the, to the uh, truth. And so, um, whereas, and therefore often embrace uh, extreme and unjustified interpretations of certain facts that simply can't be discussed, um, and therefore uh, were never inoculated to the mo uh, against the most extreme interpretation. So I'll, I'll, let me be concrete. Yeah. Um, the idea that, that men and women are indistinguishable, that are, that except for socialization. That, that babies are, are born uh, identical. Uh, now, I think there's a lot of evidence that, that that's not true, that there are differences between um, men and women. Uh, now, that, if that is an unmentionable uh, uh, fact, then the first time you hear it, and when you start to either look around you or become privy to findings from science that show that, that, uh, that the sexes aren't indistinguishable, then you can start to wonder, well, gee, well, maybe this whole idea of feminism was a mistake and we should go back to, to traditional roles. Now, that's a non sequitur because the ideals of feminism are moral and political ideals that people ought to be treated as individuals fairly and not be prejudged on the basis of their uh, sex. So it's actually completely irrelevant to the ideals of feminism, whether men and women are identical in all respects. But if you can't even mention, the, the uh, discuss the empirical situation of how do men and women differ or not differ, then you might be open to this reactionary um, uh, idea that, that feminism has been a mistake, whereas if it could be discussed how men and women do or don't differ, then you could make the point that that's not what feminism is, was about in the first place. Uh, so the, uh, and, and there are other examples where not being allowed to discuss something um, creates a, uh, a not so safe space for uh, rather toxic ideas to fester, never having been countered in arenas of open debate. That I, I, I sort of struggled with this. I went to Berkeley, which is not exactly a bastion of conservatism. Um, and I, uh, I always saw like the idea of political correctness on campus as just one of dignity for the people that um, we're referring to. And um, I never felt censored by it. And it seems like there's this description of college campuses that seems so foreign to me, even going to one of the most liberal schools in the country. Uh, would you say like the environment on college campuses is, is definitively changing it, with I mean, regard to this? I mean, changing since you were a student, yeah. and uh, I, I think uh, you know, uh, it, it was it was pretty bad when I was a student too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is, I mean, I remember a. Uh, 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 some, some uh, people behind uh, one of these card tables with a uh, Marxist, Leninist, Trotskyist, Socialist, United Workers uh, Student Association. That was Association. a Tuesday at Berkeley. Yeah, right, yes. <laughs> uh, but I remember, uh, 
I remember one of them get in a screaming match with another student and yelling, fascists don't, fascists don't have the right to speak. Fascist being anyone who is not a Marxist, Leninist, Trotskyist, mm. Socialist Workers United Party member. Uh, so it goes back, and I think that, that a lot, I, I'm not among those who think that this is a problem with, uh, you know, with millennials in particular, or this generation. I think it was the, the baby boomers who, 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 uh, who fostered this. But the fact, I, so I don't know whether it's gotten worse, but it is a problem. Uh, mm. It is a problem when um, a lot of issues just don't see the, the light of day in college campuses because people such as, I mean, and there, there's a long list. I mean, I've written about, I have an article called uh, um, in um, uh, Introduction to the Book, What is Your Dangerous Idea? Where I list maybe 30 or 40 ideas that, uh, that are uh, dangerous in the sense that one gets in trouble if you're even raising them. All right, we have a number of questions from the audience that I'm going to try to get us uh, through quickly. Um, the first and most intriguing one to me is, is Enlightenment now a movement? Should it be? Oh, <laughs> uh, n not if it was organized, certainly not if it was organized around a set of uh, uh, heroes and dogmas and uh, creeds. Uh, you know, that, that, that would be a problem. Um, it, it, it should be, and it is, although um, not necessarily under that rubric, but just the um, increased emphasis on reason, on evidence, on uh, human well-being. So if, that, if, uh, if that's what enlightenment now is, then, 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 that, then that should be a movement. Uh, and, it, and, it, and to some extent it is. There has been press toward human rights as opposed to national glory um, you know, and, and other beneficial developments. Um, thinking about this book, it, it, like it's hard to separate a lot of the ideals that that you're discussing in this book versus our current political environment. Um, do you think about the the future of our um, pol our pol uh, political discourse in the context of this book? Because it does seem like everyone is telling me that discourse is dead. Yeah, no, disc discourse is definitely not dead. Uh, there's all, maybe all too much discourse. Uh, <laughs> it, it is not dead, it's, and, and we, we shouldn't, of course, idealize the past in thinking that, uh, that, 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 that there was dispassionate uh, evidence-based debate mm -hmm. in the political arena in the past. If you look at congressional debates from uh, 100 years ago, there was a lot of uh, idiocy. Uh, uh, that for, uh, in some cases, Arguments that would just be, uh, even by today's standards, uh, would be beyond beyond the pale. So, for example, uh, that uh, you could have a congressman in, in. Actually, this is here in California, discussing immigration policy, and the uh, he was saying, "Well, God gave um, the uh, Africa to the black man, and he gave uh, Asia to the yellow man, and he gave Europe to the uh, the white man, and of course he gave the Americas to the red man, but we stole it fair and square, and so there shouldn't be any uh, yellow people in, uh, in, in, in the Americas. Now, I mean, even by today's standards, <laughs> that would be uh, kind of beyond the pale, but that was congressional testimony uh, uh, 100 years ago. Uh, so there's a lot of idiocy in the I didn't past look too. at the Kavanaugh hearing today. I might, it might have yeah. been around that level. Uh, but um, will there, I mean, I, one thing I do worry about is um, are the for, counter enlightenment forces that are associated with authoritarian nationalist populism going to push back against liberal democracy, enlightenment values? Is this kind of, is, is Trumpism the way of, wave of the future? And, and uh, you know, we don't know. I, I, I hope not, and I don't think so for a number of reasons, but, but uh, it'd be, uh, I'm not an optimist in the sense of saying, yeah, yeah, don't worry. There's I mean, work to be done. There's the, work to be done. That this progress isn't inevitable. It takes us putting in um, a consistent work over time. Absolutely. It's We've the got longevity didn't just go up because, it's because we... That, all that, exactly. That's right. Uh, since you've talked much about you know what has motivated people in the in the past, uh, what do you think about universal basic income, especially when we're talking about this in the context of, of progress, giving yeah. people sort of a, a backbone uh, to live? Yeah, it's an idea that, that is definitely worth taking seriously. It's not not so easy to get the numbers to add up, and it may be that something perhaps short of universal basic income, but perhaps an expansion of the earned income tax credit, where the government kind of tops up the 
um, salaries of the poorest as a kind of negative income tax, uh, just to preserve uh, incentives to work, to take risks, to uh, become educated. But something that is more in that direction than what we have now might be, um, uh, is a time, idea whose time has come, simply because we don't, we, in the face of greater automation, our response shouldn't be, well, let's preserve uh, the jobs of coal miners and taxi drivers and, uh, and, and forklift operators. They're not great jobs uh, if we have robots doing them. Uh, as long as we protect the interests of people, we shouldn't worry about protecting the interests of jobs. It hasn't been a great loss, for example, that there are no more elevator operators. There used to be. There used to be guys who would just spend all day um, making elevators stop at different floors. They were put out of work by automation. Uh, that is, elevators where you just press a button. That has not been a loss to society. So what we have to do is figure out how to protect the interests of people, even if the composition of jobs changes. And a UBI might be the way, a way to do it. Uh, one last question for you, and thank you so much for uh, all this time tonight, is how do you handle those that seem impermeable to factfulness? Yeah. <laughs> What's your well, advice? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure that I uh, 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 that, that that I'm speaking to 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 those people. Um, I'm speaking to you people, uh, to to people who are at least enough open to persuasion that they would buy a book and come to an evening and listen to to uh, po to, to different viewpoints. Um, how you can kind of make certain attitudes go go viral. Uh, so that the society as a whole changes. Uh, I don't think we really understand how that change happens. So why, as irrational as people are today, and there's a lot of irrationality, there's a lot of superstition, you know, most people don't believe in unicorns. Uh, 800 years ago, they did. Uh, most people, if their child gets sick, they don't go to a witch doctor. Uh, they, don't do, they don't have an exorcism. But a couple of hundred years ago, they might have. So we have gotten smarter, despite ourselves. How do you... How do the changes that originate in Enlightenment thinking uh, come to become second nature in a population? Is it through education? Is it through social norms that, uh, that proliferate from the top down? Uh, I don't think we really know how society changes in that way. And I don't know how to accelerate it other than by writing books and having conversations. You know, you sound dangerously close to an optimist there for a second. <laughs> um, our thanks to Steven Pinker, the Johnson family. Thank you. Thank you. I'd also like to thank Chen, uh, Ken and Jackie Broad, uh, their family fund for their generous support of this conversation, as well as our travel partner, United Airlines, tonight. Uh, Dr. Pinker will be up here signing books on stage here in just a minute. So if you're interested in getting your book signed, please stay seated for further information. And with that, I'm Kishore Hari, and this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks so much.